today in the show we have tokenized communities, crypto regulation in Brazil, the DAO hacker audit, and much more. I'm your host Mauricio Magaldi and this is Block Drops, your weekly digest on blockchain for business. These news are not a form of endorsement, sponsorship or encouragement for consumption and are meant for educational purposes only. The big expectations for 2022 in the Web3 space is the sort of coming of age of the DAOs, the decentralized autonomous organizations, which are multiple people around the world collaborating in a common objective or common objectives. The DAOs, as much as uh, the rest of Web3, DeFi, trading, NFTs, also suffer from a poor user experience in general. If you've ever um, made part of a DAO, you know that it's really hard to keep track of everything that's happening. And if you're in multiple DAOs, that's a really impossible task to be accomplished in a sort of organized and really compelling way. Now, ran right into Backdrop. Backdrop is a, a project, a functionality that allows DAOs and other tokenized communities to actually be more organized, more decentralized, and provide better UX for the DAO participants uh, and let them capture, govern, um, act on it, vote in a way that wasn't... Um, that wasn't uh, possible uh, before, right? Backdrop is built uh, on a Web3 native architecture, meaning it's decentralized in terms of the tooling and the infrastructure that they use and the team is also decentralized. The idea of the backdrop is to be able to connect the people within these communities and help them discover, um, be notified about the community activity um, that will allow them a bigger participation in voting processes and in general create a better overall UX uh, for the DAO participants. Uh, three sort of features that are highlighted in the link that I share with you in the episode notes is one is to fight Discord fatigue. Uh, Discord has become uh, somehow the like the platform of choice for most of the DAOs to gather the community. It has uh, servers, you can configure multiple channels, it allows you to automate a bunch of tasks with bots. But if you are over 35, you will be hard pressed to get into and have a, like a proper experience because it's overwhelming. There is a bunch of stuff happening. I'm not even in these many DAOs and I have countless uh, channels, countless servers that I'm part of. I have to, you know, mute notifications all the time. It's super complicated to keep track of everything that's going on. So it's not necessarily an easy experience. With Backdrop, you will get all of the activity simplified in in in-app or email notifications about governance proposals, announcements crowdfunding and key information from the community. So there's a a layer of curation that is automated on top of the data that's flowing through the Discord uh, servers. Second uh, feature is to uh, reduce the Etherscan tracking by users. Etherscan is an Ethereum tool for you to scan the activity in Ethereum. It requires you to learn how to read it, learn how you know, to separate the addresses and the transaction codes and whatnot. So Backdrop will give you context on top of that, provide you also off-chain data on the uh, projects and profiles, will help discover and understand what's happening within that particular community um, without you having to go through either scan and will unlock better community participation because the threads are organized, they are integrated within the app uh, for the tokenized community we're part of and requires pretty much no setup. So participation, but better organized data will allow for better participation. I think this is a very important uh, 
sort of uh, innovation in the space because the easier it gets to participate, the more participation we get from the communities. And that's exactly the objectives of the DAOs, which is decentralized decisions, decentralized governance, and let multiple people chip in to the destinations of the organizations that they are a part of. With easier navigation, easier UX, you get better contribution. So let's see how this establishes itself as a trend in the year of the DAO. The Economic Affairs Committee from the Brazilian Senate approved a bill this week that acknowledges and regulates Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in the market in the country, according to their official statement. They had a unanimous approval of a uh, bill of law that was authored in 2019 by Senator Flavio Arns and also crafted in conjunction with the central bank, the SEC, CVM in Brazil, and the Federal Tax Authority, which is an important step in the sort of uh, evolution of this market in Brazil. There's also another bill uh, in the House of Representatives in Brazil, also uh, discussing uh, this market and how it should be operated, regulated, which agencies should be in charge of which portion of the market. Uh, that is also running and it's expected to uh, be hitting both houses uh, in the year, uh, throughout the year. Um, most of the topics at hand are very interesting because they give the Brazilians a framework in which to operate and it, it certainly indicates uh, the maturity of uh, the market in, in, in this particular industry, but it's also somewhat of a... Uh, potential red alert to the entrepreneurs in the space because one of the aspects of this um, bill approved by the CAE is that if you are a crypto company, you are to be understood by agencies and regulators as a financial services company. And we all know that financial services is one of, if not the most regulated industry across the globe, and it's no different in Brazil. So the demands for regulatory compliance for these uh, emerging companies in this emerging industry, if that uh, is to be approved and sanctioned by the executive branch, that means uh, that regulatory obligations and observance will be at the forefront of the investment of these emerging companies which will remove the focus on products and services, which is what actually drives the innovation and adoption in the space. So uh, I would really encourage crypto entrepreneurs, uh, Web3 entrepreneurs, metaverse entrepreneurs, uh, whatever you call yourself, to actually pay attention to what is being discussed in Brasilia uh, regarding um, this new regulatory framework. Uh, and also pay attention with your board of advisors, your legal advisors, uh, as to what the impacts are going to be in your uh, business model, in your tokenomics, uh, in, in the dynamics, and even in your product roadmap uh, with regards to this um, new regulation. Because most of the companies that are dealing with, say, NFTs, are not necessarily thinking of NFT as a financial service uh, with regards to how it's perceived by the market and the regulators. Um, those that are dealing with DeFi are probably more used to this because decentralized finance speaks for itself, right? It's, it's, it's in the name. But if you are, say, tokenizing other types of real-world assets that don't necessarily speak directly to financial services, uh, you might see yourself now um, under this new regulatory framework, which will force you to think of your business model as a financial services business model with the corresponding implications in regulatory compliance. So um, we're still um, in early stages of this discussion. Uh, there's been a lot of hearing hearings in the Senate and the House. There's uh, these two bills running in parallel, um, but the discussion is here. And if we are to be a more mature market in the Web3 space, we all need to chip in and contribute with uh, the public discussion. 
the Ethereum ecosystem is one of the most prolific and one of the most innovative uh, ecosystems in the Web3 space. And part of this is because not only was the first programmable blockchain, but it also opened um, the path for multiple business models that didn't exist before. One of them, and we're covering this a lot these days, is um, the DAOs, the Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. And one of the biblical events in the Ethereum history is the hacking of the DAO that happened uh, back in 2016-17. Uh, this was uh, the first of its kind. It was uh, designed as a decentralized venture capital fund and they raised around 139 million in Ether um, at the time, which was the equivalent in dollars at the time. And the uh, crowd sale went on in 2016. It was the most successful crowdfunding uh, event um, at that time. Weeks later, a hacker just siphoned 31% of all of the Ether that was sitting in the DAO's treasury, uh, which was around 5% of all the ETH uh, available for the market at the time. And that was siphoned from the DAO into what later became known as the Dark DAO. And one of the great mysteries of the Ethereum, uh, this huge Ethereum hack was who did this, right? Who was the person or the people involved in this massive hack in a very early stage of the technology and the ecosystem itself? So journalist Laura Shin, who's one of the first mainstream journalists to cover crypto full time, is launching her book, this week, it just came out, it's called The Cryptopians, Idealism, Greeds, Lies and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze. And in her investigations to write the book, which covers this particular period, she found out that 36-year-old programmer who grew up in Austria and was living in Singapore at the time of the hack, Toby Honish, seems to be the perpetrator of the DAO hacking. Toby is also known in the market as the co-founder and CEO of 10X, which was one of the largest uh, ICOs in 2017, uh, raising $80 million uh, in an ICO aiming to build the first crypto debit card, which is an effort that never saw the light of the day. So Toby is thought to be the perpetrator of this massive hack and also it was the first time that a hack in an application or a dApp running on top of Ethereum forced a major fork on the protocol itself, meaning that Ethereum at this point had to be thought to either roll back and prevent the losses from ever happening or continue and take on the losses for the community. And that forced what we know now as the Ethereum fork and separated the Ethereum into two different blockchains. One is the blockchain of the Ethereum, which we all know and uh, the market is using uh, largely. And the other one is the Ethereum Classic, which didn't roll back those losses. And it's currently used by only uh, you know, a, a smaller community at this time. So this was, that's why we're calling this a biblical uh, event in the Ethereum history is because it forced a dApp, forced um, the protocol to be changed to accommodate that uh, particular event. Uh, for us Brazilians, it's interesting there is also uh, a Brazilian uh, named as part of this investigation. Um, the Brazilian goes by the name of AFSA in social networks uh, and is also named in the book. And we're going to try and bring uh, AFSA to speak with us here uh, for future blog talks, explain his participation on all of these uh, perspiring events. So, and I will be reading the Cryptopians in the coming weeks. I'm hoping I get the, my hands on the book in, uh, next week. And I'll share with you also my findings as I go along this incredible journey. And because the week was back full of news, here's more. 
IBM now investing in crypto custody for institutional clients. B2Me will be the first crypto platform authorized in Spain. Seba Bank was approved by the Ave community to use its ARC institutional app. Bulgarian Stock Exchange is now trading eight crypto ETFs. FTX launched its gaming unit and also a white label for crypto as a service. A DAO is being organized to buy the NFL's Denver Broncos. Solana now has an NFT vending machine available in New York City. The Spanish Stock Exchange will try an on-chain feature for carbon offsets. The CBDC eCorona of Sweden enters its Phase 3. Brazilian exchange Foxbit raised 21 million from the OK Group to improve products and services. Spotify is hiring an engineer for Web3. Upbit in Korea will launch an NFT credit card. Puma has registered its ENS address and updated the Twitter uh, name for Puma.eth, Puma.eth entering the NFT space. Luna Foundation uh, is hedging its stablecoin UST from the dollar with an additional 1 billion in Bitcoin to its treasury. Crypto is not a crime, says the US Circuit Service. Nisey parent company ICE invested in T0, a security token company. The Opera browser will now integrate Ethereum Layer 2 Diversify Wallet. Andrew Yang, former US president candidate, launched a Web3 lobbying community. The GBBC uh, released its annual report. Cybercoin, which is a fertilizer backed cryptocurrency, was launched in Brazil. MUFG is dropping their open payments platform, announced a crypto and NFT wallet, and also a utility token feature. BNY Mellon will launch a crypto custody service. Monster Energy Drink filed four metaverse trademarks. Inevitable launched an NFT course with free proof of attendance. After Life for DM with X Meta developers now raising 2 million to bring DM to life. Coinbase is starting its operation in Brazil and looking for a country director. The Supremacy game was launched in Australia and developers, independent developers, launched NFT World on Minecraft using Polygon. The Block Drops podcast is available on Anchor FM, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcasts, Numis, and iColab. You can reach out to us through Instagram at Block Drops Podcast, on Twitter at Block Drops Pod, and via email blockdropspodcast at gmail.com. Yay! Shoutouts today to the people who share the links you find in the episode notes Fabio Kezini, Brian Sania, Ajay Tripati, Jamie Burke. Jason Janowitz, Guerra Kiwana, Laura Shin, Brian De Souza, Jean Hansen, John Hamilton, JW, Levi Brocklehurst, Ana Paula Picasso, Claudia Mancini, Grant Duncan, Andrea Frosinini, Roberto Machado, Bankless HQ, Richard Hamilton Stove, Alex Nascimento, João Guilherme Lira, Len Tran, and Kevin Lawson. Don't forget to leave your rating on your favorite player. This is all for today. Stay rare, stay weird, LFG. Mm-hmm.